The views expressed by our guests in the following video are solely the opinions of our guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and or opinions of the Ola7 podcast show. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and welcome once again to the Spotlight with Yvonne Magunda on the Honor 7 podcast platform. Yes, last week was blazing. I mean, Murape Murape was just being candid about life at Dynamos. But I thought this week, let's talk to a man who can give us a story that we all relate to where you don't have to be affiliated to the club, but you're affiliated to the nation. We all unite when the Warriors are in action. We all want the best for the Warriors. And I think in the current campaign for the Africa of Nations qualification, we've all come together and witnessed the brilliant stuff that is happening with the team and the position in which we're very close to qualification for the next edition. So I decided to bring in the studio the coach of the Warriors. Drum roll, please. I feel like I wish I had a drum. Welcome to the show, Mr. Michael Nies. Yeah, good morning, Yvonne. How are you? So, um, yo, I don't know where to start, but I've always had this question. I've always wanted to ask to a foreign coach that comes to a different land to say, how do you get to a decision where you decide, there's this country in Zimbabwe. I want to go there. I want to go and coach there. How did you get to that decision? In, in football, it's not like you can have a wish and then it comes into reality. Um, if you want to work, first of all, you uh, need to decide or make a decision to work in football. And uh, when I finished my studies in uh, '96 at the University of Heidelberg, uh, I was already had an A license because I started as a very young coach, as a youth coach in my home club when I was 19 years old. I did that for four years. And uh, the opportunity came. I had an A license, I had a master degree in sports science, and there was an exchange program from my university with uh, South Africa. And uh, then I decided, hey, I joined this project. I wanted to actually have a little bit of break after uh, uh, my six-year study at university enjoy a little bit of time, do some voluntary work in South Africa. We, we worked that time in football and sports development in the townships of uh, Cape Town, that time the disadvantaged communities. Then uh, we, uh, I lectured at the University of Western Cape. Then I gave uh, coaching courses in, in uh, uh, Port Elizabeth, that time equivalent B licenses. So I d we did a lot of uh, things. We also worked with street, uh, street children at that time. We were like a group. And uh, of, uh, they were still students. I finished my degree already. And I was already coaching before and I was playing football until third, fourth division. And I said, come, let's go <laughs> outside for half a year or nine months and then see what uh, life, professional life will make with you. And uh, so the decision was, uh, that was more or less the beginning. And uh, when I came back, uh, I started basically at the University of Stuttgart as a sports scientist. I wanted to restart, still play for a couple of years football, third, fourth division in Germany. And uh, so I started, I was a sports scientist at a uh, full-time, very good position, academic, academic career on the high rise, horizon. So, and uh, then... There was an advertisement, uh, a friend of mine made me aware of, hey, Michael, there's an there's a advertisement in the Kika Sports Magazine, the biggest sports magazine in Germany, football magazine, and uh, as a coach to go to Japan. And while I was working there at the university, I thought, come, let's apply and see what it is, because you must also know, you didn't know what uh, uh, what the job is about. So I applied and there was interviews and I was taken. And then I quit my job, safe job. And I said, come, let's go to Japan. So then I was three years in Japan doing in a city of Kitakyushu together with the Ministry of Sports and the, and the Football Association. And I developed football there from grassroots to their top level. I 
I worked with basically each age group between under 13, 14 until senior teams. And I did many other projects with the selected teams from the whole South Japan uh, Football Association. Uh, selected teams. Did, I was invited like a uh, like a guest coach, you know. So it was very interesting, and Japan was very demanding because they they very very hard working people, very good work ethics, very good manners, very disciplined. And I think I had in these three years easily thousand training sessions in all age groups, if not more. And in Germany, I would have to work maybe 10 years to get this amount of experience. So Japan, I have to be very grateful of the experience uh, which I made in Japan. It was very tough you know, in a different culture, in a different country, very uh, remote country and, and, and very, very much different that time before the uh, beginning of the smartphone area. I didn't even have a smartphone that time, you know, uh, or a, a cell phone. And... Uh, then I applied to be, to to be accepted in the in the pro license in Germany, and uh, I was accepted for the for the course two thousand one, and uh, I worked then between was my daughter was born uh, and and I worked as a to because the pro license is very demanding. You need to get released so. I did a little bit uh, in an international school, just uh, near my home, just a little bit, uh, so part-time to be able to do my pro license. Yeah? And when the pro license was finished, uh, actually the DFB approached me, hey, they have international projects. I was uh, speaking English and, and uh, also I was speaking French. And I had a pro license, I had international experience already on, in, in, in South Africa, in Japan. And of course, I had experience in Germany with youth teams and with the local football association. And I, so I went, yeah, they, they, they wanted me to be part of the international projects. And then everything, it was not like a planned career plan. So I... I just did my job always as good as possible and opportunities uh, came out of that. For example, then I was uh, for the DFB doing the HENEF A license course in French. That time it was a very prestigious course until I think uh, 2014 was the last time they did it. And uh, then someone recommended me. Uh, they were happy what I did and they recommended me in the Seychelles Islands. Uh, they were looking for a national coach. Suddenly the telephone was ringing Friday morning. I can remember that. And there was the general secretary on the phone. If I want to come for interview to Seychelles. And of course, I didn't say no because my mind was, oh, Seychelles, nice beaches, great <laughs> but, hotels <laughs> but, <laughs> and football. So that's the perfect combination. Yeah. But you talk about, um, you know, you talk about South Africa, you talk about Seychelles and, and, and you know, Japan. You're, you're a risk taker, I assume, because to move to Israel, to move to Kosovo because of, you know, reputations and how the media portray some countries. Even as a European, when you hear the stories about Africa, about Zimbabwe, why did you make those decisions to go oh. to those countries? No, look, when I was young, I was always interested in other countries. Really, um, that really attracted me. I was also keen on traveling. I, when I was a student, there was one time a winter break in football, you know, you couldn't organize that because every time as a student you had uh, uh, holidays, you had pre-season or uh, training or matches, and there was one time opportunity, so I took a backpack and traveled uh, around Indonesia as a young guy for four weeks. So I was always a little bit interested in other countries and other cultures, and uh, I studied also, apart from sports, sports medicine and sports exercise physiology, uh, also ethnology. Ethnology is something where you actually uh, study the indi indigenous cultures in different countries and the life changed a lot in the last 30 years, that's for sure. And I didn't know exactly uh, what it was, but it was so interesting because football is also part of culture. And uh, my interest was basically there already and, and, and yes, I took, but I was much younger. I took risks, but I was much, much younger. Sure, <laughs> when I quit the university, uh, academic career, for to go to Japan, that was a big step. 
Yeah, if uh, to be frankly honest, that time I was much younger. Um, if you would predict how professional, you know, how the life goes, I'm not sure if I, if I would do it again. <laughs> and yeah. how you were German born and raised, right? Yes. How did you get to speak the different languages? You said you said English, you said French. Um, no, when uh, look, um, English you learn at school. I had also French at school. I did my, uh, how do you call it, abitur metric or something uh, in, in, in one of the subjects uh, was French. But I was not great. <laughs> don't, 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 don't think. Then I, then I, uh, you tr I traveled, you know, in, in, it's easy in Europe. You're France, you travel, yeah. then you make friends, you travel, you speak to them. And then I started studying... Uh, 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 Studying at university, actually, I was first. I started to, to be a sports teacher and a French teacher, and uh, so I started. Uh, I studied uh, French for one semester only, but then I said, "Ah, that's not exactly. I want to learn the language, but I'm not sure if I want to teach it." And um, and then you 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 have to practice. Uh, I wasn't. My English was not. It's not perfect, but it's uh, it was not. When I arrived in, in South Africa in 1996, it was at the beginning very difficult. And three months later, I had to deliver a B license in parentheses course in Port Elizabeth. And it was very tough for me. Uh, I was thrown into the, yeah, into the, the fight. Or do, how do you call it? Yeah, the, <laughs> you, you have to just learn by doing. And, uh, and also I remember when I did that coaching course in French for the DFB, I wasn't speaking for think almost 10 years, ah, 10 years not, but eight years not speaking French. So you forget also a lot. So I did private lessons. On my English football notes, I had a private teacher. It costed me, I, I remember, it costed me, I think, 2,000 euros from my own pocket to, to, to uh, how do you say, to renew. Your you need to, to invest in your own, and then the reward comes a little bit later back. So, um, are you, are you, we don't know how long you'll be here, <laughs> hopefully for a long time in Zimbabwe. Are you going to learn any of the indigenous languages like your Shana? Yeah, I mean, learning in detail will be, I'm sure, no, difficult. Like that would mean I, I, I have a lot of free time and not, not much work to do. <laughs> but, of course, I need to... Like your I, basic uh, greeting. Uh, yes, that I want, to be frankly honest. At the moment, because every day there's a surprises. <laughs> when you say, hey, I want to maybe do something from 11 until 12, your whole uh, day is changing. It's still too unpredictable, but I need to. Uh, it's, it's, it's not good. If I stay longer, I need to. But you have... The difficulty is... How many languages do you have? Um, officially, we have 11 live, languages. 11, so I don't want to discriminate any language. So I couldn't make a choice yet, which <laughs> I should start. <laughs> but you you could start with your Shona and Debele and then get into the other languages. Ah, so yeah, that, um, we, we spoke about all these countries that, that you went to. Um, I'd be interested in how you landed in Zimbabwe. How was it an advert? Did you have an interview? What was the process like? I must first where I stopped before. You know, when I went to the Seychelles then as a national coach and I was a young coach that time. Maybe I was the youngest national coach around the world. You know, there are 205 countries and I think I was the youngest. And, and then our first national team match was in Zimbabwe. I say that before on other forums in front of 60,000 people and uh, national sports stadium <laughs> yes and this was my first match as a national coach and we lost 3-1 but very tight and then three months later we could win the game so i played already two times against zimbabwe and uh, after uh, this job in the seychelles I, I did smaller projects for the dfp and on a private in, in tunisia in togo in uzbekistan but shorter projects for the DFB again, and uh, then I was uh, in a in a in a different capacity for the World Cup. There was a World Cup coming in Germany, and uh, they, they they were looking for uh, people who helped the teams, like a coordinator. 
And I applied because I thought, ah, the African countries, they're not so good organized. You know, when they come to the World Cup, always stress with the bonuses and this and transport <laughs> and this. And I had experience as a coach, but I think I'm also a person who can organize things uh, on a decent level. And uh, then I applied. I said, okay, we wait for until the, 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 the qualification matches were over. And I had my mind, okay, maybe Togo or something like that. And then they asked me, Mr. Nes, you live near Karlsruhe? Yes, I said, um, okay, you know the England team lives uh, there in Ban Ban, just 30 kilometers away from Karlsruhe. Would you be ready to take care of the England national team as a coordinator or team officer, liaison officer? That was the first time this position was created. I said, wow, great. So I wanted to do something in the World Cup. I wasn't... That time, it doesn't matter. I wanted to be part of that because it was a unique experience when the World Cup is in your country. It's a one-time experience in your life. And then I was ta basically taking charge of the uh, of the England national team as a coordinator or team liaison officer from uh, the day of the draw in, uh, in, in Leipzig until one day after elimination. Every time they were here in Germany or so, I, I had to take care of them. And um, this was a very good opportunity to learn uh, management team, administrative management, and uh, how a team behind the team operates, which influenced me a lot as a coach. You know? I couldn't act like a coach because my role was different, but I got unique insight. I was every training session. I was very important because that time it was before the smartphone, iPhone area. <laughs> yeah, and everything what they had to do had to go through me. So I was the contact point to FIFA organizing committee and everything what they wanted to change had to go through me. And uh, so I was really had to be always be present, not always to do something, but you had to be there uh, always with them and, and, uh, and think ahead of them if they need something. And that was a very unique experience with the maybe greatest English team from the individual players Beckham, Rooney, uh, Michael Owen, uh, John Terry, Frank Lambert, all these superstars. That time uh, I cannot uh, tell them, uh, I cannot say all the names because they were all top class players. And I worked with them and that was unique uh, uh, experience for me to learn management of a team behind the team. And... Uh, and then uh, during that time already I said, okay, after the World Cup, I want to continue again, back go to coaching. And uh, there was an opportunity that uh, Rwanda was looking for a national coach. And I got in touch with them. And uh, then we had the first interview during the World Cup. <laughs> but I couldn't work uh, because England was eliminated and then I was free to meet them. And then we had a meeting during the World Cup, I remember, in Stuttgart. Uh, and um, it was very good. And then uh, we had another meeting in Brussels and then they said, okay, we take you as a national coach. We, we are convinced you can do that. And then I went to Rwanda as a national coach. Um, Rwanda was a very good experience. Also a country with a troubled past. Um, but uh, that time there was not much trouble. I must say uh, the, the, it was very stable and you could see already development taking place very much. It was, uh, uh, you could already anticipate how will Rwanda look in 10, 15 years. And it's now maybe one of a top 10 country in Africa, maybe even higher from in terms of many aspects. And uh, it was, a, but football was very difficult there because they always had players from outside giving like passports, <laughs> service passports, because the borders were not so clearly defined. And then, uh, uh, um, they wanted to start a new team with more local players, basically local young players. So I had to rebuild a team. The federation was new and uh, we had a difficult start, I remember, but uh, then we got better and better and better. And uh, But uh, we couldn't qualify for the African Cup of Nations. It was with that team that time really difficult. So um, as you... Is that also one of your, your dreams to be able to go and coach an African team at the African Cup of Nations? Yes, of course. I wouldn't be here if this wouldn't be my goal. But uh, with uh, Rwanda, then it finished, then I went to South Africa. And while I was in South Africa as director of coaching and education, uh, you know, I, 
I had very good uh, working uh, after the World Cup. We had very good conditions. Safa really invested a lot in education. They followed my plan, 100 person. And I did two pro license courses, which was in a value of 350 to 400,000 dollars, one course. One course. So we developed in two courses around 50 to 60. I cannot recall exactly how many coaches. And some of them, all uh, Mamelodi Sundance coaches since 10 years came from this course. All SAFA technical directors since 2012 come from this course. Many PSL coaches, big names or people which were not so famous like Rolani Mokwena, he came from this course. And during that time, the Seychelles again approached me. So, so coach, um, you've coached all these teams, but we're still getting to the point of uh, the Zimbabwe story, like how did you land in Zimbabwe? Because yes. the first thing we just heard about you was a press release to say, Michael Nice has been appointed. Yes, but uh, let me just come, while I was in South Africa, the Seychelles again approached me because they said, Michael, you must come again to, to Seychelles, coach the national team. I said, Oof, look, I mean, I have a big project in South Africa. I cannot come. I didn't coach their team, South Africa, because my role was different. But I said, I can come for weeks uh, to help you if you need me, because they were playing again against Zimbabwe, oh. against the same with the same coach, <laughs> and they thought, hey, if Michael so Nis beat them, been calling. He's and been if calling. Some, if uh, if uh, if I beat them in two thousand three against Sun, I think Sunday Chin some Chamba was the coach. And they said, if I could beat them in 2003, maybe I can beat them again in 2010. <laughs> so I said, look, guys, I can come for weeks. We see, but I will not quit my job in, in South Africa. That's too good. My family was settled there, everything with schools, the children. And so I made these two games. We lost at home for two, very entertaining match. And then in uh, Zimbabwe 2-0. So I played again two times, but uh, it was decent results with the team in 2010, I must really say. So Zimbabwe. Then I made different jobs. I went to Europe. It was good because I, you know, the biggest challenge is when you're um, in working in football to combine private family and uh, your job obligations. If you're a bachelor, if you have no family, you can hop from club to club. If you're a little bit successful, that's not so difficult. If you, if you have good language skills, good education, and a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, uh, but it's not stable. And uh, within you have a family, you need to have a little bit more stability. That's why I went, uh, had the opportunity, not why I went, but I had the opportunity to go to Israel and then afterwards to Kosovo. So I was the, from between 2013 until the next 10 years in Europe working as technical director and under 21 national coach. Also very nice positions, very good uh, because football is very professionalized there. And... Um, Kosovo, uh, uh, after five years, came to an end. And then I had a little bit to, to do a break. I had two, three operations, I must also say. I had to build uh, an apartment where you have to be there with all the contractors. I uh, also had to take a little bit care of family, you know, which, uh, was, uh, which was difficult uh, years before. And uh, then I said, okay, I wanted to, to work again in football. But I also had another job opportunity somewhere else, not in football, but in sports in general. And uh, so then the advertisement from Zimbabwe was advertised. There was, but there was also other teams advertised. Yeah, I was actually in loose, <laughs> in loose connections with two other federations. If, I'm, if I can say that, I don't say which now. And I had this other job which was outside of football. So in maybe not one hundred percent sure, but it looked very good. And that was advertised, and, and I said, ah, let's come. You started against Zimbabwe. Let's give it a try. You know, and I sent my papers. And uh, I remember then there was an interview. I was invited for an interview. Oh, great. And then I was already online, but then suddenly uh, the people are in Thailand in, in uh, the FIFA Congress and we have technical problems. And so, so I was already sitting for my interview there. And I said, ah, good. The try was worth, I think someone might, maybe they Ooh. chose someone and they just didn't, didn't want to accept. So I said, okay, no problem. And then all of a sudden, uh, while I was in Senegal, yes, I was there in Senegal six weeks in, in, in May, June, 
I got again contact. Mr. Ness, you are shortlisted. No, you, you must, you must pre- make a presentation. And I said, oh, now I have to work every day. And then I must make this presentation in a, in a very short period. It was already out of my mind, you know. And then I said, ah, must I do this now, presentation? They said, come, let's give a try. I was sitting until three o'clock in the night, two nights, because oh, during the day I had to work. And I said, come, let's do it. And at least the effort, you know, uh, Yeah, I did that. I think the presentation was even really good. I, I was very happy, you know. Sometimes under pressure you can do better can things than when you do not so. But it was tiring and I submitted and I didn't hear anything. And I said, ah, come. Uh, well, you moved on. <laughs> yeah, 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 it, it was already out, out of my mind. I'm telling you it was already out of my mind. And then all of a sudden they came, ah, Mr. Nis, uh, uh, you're for an interview. And I said, okay. And I, I was already prepared before, but then uh, because of uh, for the May interview, but not as good as in July. So uh, something what doesn't happen sometimes is even good. <laughs> and then say, okay, now if the interview, now I prepare myself proper. Yeah? And then we had this interview. It was in July, I think. Yes, it was in uh, around middle of July because you know what? Uh, because it went very late. Because I knew the uh, FCON qualifiers, and so they will start in in September. And I said, hey, shit, now we get a little bit, now it's getting late. But I said, okay, I prepared me for the interviews, and the interviews were very well, very challenging. I was really happy how the way it was conducted from CIFA, and the questions they asked, this was really sensible. And I said, hey, this is now getting more and more interesting, because... Zimbabwe didn't have their reputation. Eh? They were banned. <laughs> uh, and, and, and suddenly you think you apply a normal application, national coach in a country which was banned, and now they make it so thoroughly. And I got more and more interested because the questions were really good. And I said, hey, this is different than I thought, you know. And then there came a second round of interviews. And it went also well. There was even more people present from FI- uh, from FIFA, from uh, from CAF. Very cha- even more challenging. And I was there in a coaching conference that time. Just so uh, I was there in the hotel, and then you don't know how the internet and this and that works. And I had a little bit problem, but then it worked uh, still. And then we had an interview, and and uh, and then they informed me that they they want to conclude with me. The contract and and that's how I came to Zimbabwe. So basically, my first national team match was in against Zimbabwe, and um, almost 25 years later, the circle closed and I come back to Zimbabwe. So I knew a little bit about African football. I knew a little bit about Zimbabwe, uh, not a little bit. I, I I it was not for me that I come first time to Africa. Uh, my family basically are uh, African. Uh, my, my my children are African and German, South African and German. So it's for me not the first time to be in Africa, and uh, I could a little bit anticipate where where, where I'm going to, and uh, I always knew about the talent of the players and the possibilities if things are going well, that you can really achieve something. But I also knew about the the risks uh, um, that. Maybe things cannot go well, uh, and and uh, so that's how uh, how I ended up here. No? There was no agents involved or 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 third party interest or something. Very professional, very fair selection. I must really say, if they they looked for a certain profile, and if the profile would have been different, maybe they, someone else would have come here. Yeah, there was also good coaches uh, 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 in the short list. What I was reading, yeah, successful coaches. Don't get me wrong, and uh, and uh, but I think they looked for a certain profile. And the interviews went well, and I think that's why the the final choice went on me, and that's why I also decided to come on on uh, to Zimbabwe. But I was worried because we got very late. Let me be honest. Yeah? Middle of August, I have. To So, um, with all this that was happening, this whole process, were you also having access to the newspapers, the conversations that were happening in Zimbabwe? Because there was also restlessness amongst people to say, when are we getting this coach? When is a new coach coming? 
Yeah, of course. When you do apply or some, or you are get interested in 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 such a position, you also look what the media is writing. That's nowadays quite easy. It's not like it was fifteen, twenty years ago. It's very easy now. Um, but you must be careful not to read too much because um, you can also misjudge and uh, and misinterpret things because there's always different lobby groups influencing this and that and and uh, sometimes it's better you don't read s so much uh, as it could be like a smoke screen how do you call it a smoke, smoke screen so yeah. you know about the whole brito brito <sighs> we want brito conversation when you're reading that and then um when you did come to Zimbabwe and your appointment was made, I don't know if you've heard the word plumber. Have you ever come across Ach, that? Ach, that's a word. <laughs> they all, uh, if you look, I lived in South Africa. Every time a coach doesn't have a background some people want, they call him a plumber. Uh, it's a bit boring. So um, uh, did, you, did you... A plumber is a very good profession. You can earn a hell of a lot of money if you're a good plumber in Germany right now. There's almost no plumbers. So a plumber is in a very good position in Germany right now. But I think in the African context is to say, oh, you know. No. And you obviously, like you're saying, because you were on the internet, you're hearing the conversation, and you've had experience as a coach in different countries, you know that comes with an appointment where somebody, people uh, maybe hadn't coached in that country, People have an idea to say, is this a real coach? Is he? Because there are people that are lazy to research and see where you've come. And some, if they see Kosovo, Israel, Seychelles, they're thinking, huh, are they powerhouses in football? But the same they think of Zimbabwe. When you are in these countries, then they say, who, who's Zimbabwe? You know, and when you're in Zimbabwe, say, who, who's uh, Kosovo? <laughs> Kosovo is very good in football, you know. They, they, this is the biggest group of. of uh, in the academies per age category in Germany and in the, around Europe, we have about 50 or 60 players in the top academies in Europe per age category. They have a big diaspora, similar like, uh, uh, like Zimbabwe and uh, Israel. I, it's a, they have now trouble. I don't want to go into that. But in football terms, Israel was progressing very, very much. And uh, we had big success. And when you play on um, uh, with the youth national teams, I think we had a budget of two and a half, three million per year. I think something we could only dream here. Mm -hmm. So when you came to Zimbabwe, when you accepted this job, what are your plans and how what's the strategy the short and the long term <laughs> plans per meeting yeah I mean uh, the first thing was to get a good start in the African Cup uh, qualification and that was very challenging because I, uh, I learned the hard way to work under time constraints because I was always working my career was not planned as I said it came out of like it, uh, it happened as it evolved, yeah. and uh, but I was always working with uh, the last twenty years with associations and uh, in, in national teams, and I was always working under time pressure because uh, there you don't have the time like in clubs, so you have to learn how you use your time very 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 efficient. Basically, every minute counts without over organizing things that's the danger you can plan every minute and then you you come in a stiff over organized uh, environment but uh, that's the challenge and i learned the hard way to do that uh, starting in my coaching philosophy in my training philosophy because uh, i developed my own ideas and try to do this and that and um, and I knew I can work under time pressure in a short period also to, to influence the team. But this time, the time pressure was very, very, very big. And, uh, and uh, it was really a moon landing. It was borderline. Eh? Um, and uh, in, uh, when we had the first games in, uh, in Uganda against Kenya, it was very difficult. And uh, uh, because of that, that was actually the most challenging thing. So we wanted a good start. Uh, your overall objective, say qualification to the AFCON, we had to break down into smaller units. We, uh, the, 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 
for example, one unit was having a positive start to 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 not to lose the games. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the away from home in Uganda and then against the Cameroon uh, first against Kenya and then in against Cameroon Uganda. It was also new territory for the FA, for CIFA, to organize an away match in Uganda. That's not just the everyday work. And uh, how can I say? So uh, that was this, the first thing was a good start. Yeah? And we achieved that. And the, 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 the second break was we want to be in November in a position where we can determine our own fate, that we have it in our own hands. Very crucial because we're tired of taking out calculators. Yes, and... But uh, always, so I had to break down the objectives into smaller units. And basically, we had to look from day to day or from training to training to match to match. And not always looking at the, the second or third step ahead of the first step, because I think that's a weak point of Zimbabwe. They always do that. They go overboard when things go well. And they think already it We've would be like we are now looking on Cameroon instead of looking to Kenya. And uh, and uh, when it goes not wrong, then it's like a disaster. So the reality is always a little bit somewhere between. And uh, to get a little bit more realism, positive realism, in into that whole national team setup, break it down in smaller units on the way to our objective. And uh, uh, I think so far it went well. We were a bit unlucky or a bit lucky, however you can uh, interpret it. In the first two games, which I think was a really good start because the, the, the time pressure was unbelievable. And I never worked with the people. I didn't bring now my coaching staff or people I worked before. I worked with people I never worked before. Oh. I worked. Uh, com I, I actually, I didn't bring anybody in. I said, I want to work with the people who are there. So, But do you, you come at a very... I don't know how to call the time because not only is Zimbabwe not playing at home, but also we are sort of like in a transition period, if you had to say it, in terms of still trying to find the balance of locally foreign based players, um, diaspora born Zimbabwean players that are doing well in the leagues around because there's always this expectation, especially when a new coach comes because before there'd been issues of why are we choosing locally based players and let it go of the foreign ones who are diaspora born. Why are we not using these certain players? I look in Kosovo, it was a similar. It's a very small country, Kosovo, but they have a huge diaspora. And again, football diaspora for them. Football is unbelievable. No? Don't underrate such countries. And uh, it has different reasons. It's not a lack of talent. They could be a very good team in Europe from a talent point of view. And they have a huge diaspora, they have players all over Europe. And uh, it was a very similar uh, situation because Kosovo was only accepted at FIFA and at UEFA in uh, 2016 in May. And then there was a challenge from Serbia because they politically they see it as a, still as a part of of, of their country and they opposed that and they made to the court of arbitration of sport and in January they ruled against Serbia and then the Kosovo Federation was legally fully accepted and I started one month later and uh, I remember our first match was the under 21 national team I had to work first with the local coaches we, uh, we didn't have a team manager we traveled uh, th 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 that was a guy who was working in a travel agency before we we had to look for people who can work in team management and i introduced him to team management so we started actually with also like you say they were banned because they were not accepted before uh, and you were a band because you acted in a certain way uh, and uh, so a very similar situation and uh, many talents, big diaspora, new ba or back in the international scene and uh, organizational problems or, or, or a small federation and a very situation. So for me, that was not something new. And how are you planning to navigate or how you started already the games that have been played? What is your point of view in terms of diaspora born players what is the ideal way of integrating them into a national team yes uh, look uh, 
you, you have local players and you have a diaspora. Both have a right if they feel, if they have a passport. And I'm not the Department of Home Affairs. I'm not the Department of Immigration. If they have a passport or are eligible for a passport, then they are available. I cannot judge who, who is more Zimbabwe. So for me, if you have a passport, eligible for a passport, you're a Zimbabwean. I can select. And uh, so I cannot discriminate any group. Yeah. For me, so I'm totally free of that because I have no relations, no family relations or uh, any other affiliations to, to... So I can purely look on sports point of view. On the other side, uh, um, you also have good players here. You have uh, uh, in difficult circumstances. For me, the challenge is to see what is hidden in someone. What can he bring potentially when I bring him in a national team setup? It's clear players from a local game have, a, because of the difficult uh, conditions, more difficult than in Europe, more maybe space for improvement than a player from there. But on the other side, the players from there have a very good foundation. They're professional, uh, top-class coaches in, in youth development. So I must really look in a, in a, uh, who can match in at this point of time. There's a lot of very promising young players in Europe. Don't get me wrong, I know them almost all, not all, but I'm, I think I have a quite good overview. When is the right time to integrate them? Some of them are not established senior players. Uh, I cannot bring them five, six players now to, 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 to the national team in the starting lineup and then you lose and then they will say, hey, why you didn't call the, the other players? Uh, they are on the radar. I must find out when is the right time to bring someone in. I mean, sure is we have some players uh, who are a little bit older but uh, who are brought back and they will deserve a proper farewell. No, we want to give in the in the African Cup of Nations or maybe in another tournament afterwards. Uh, Is that a hint, hint, knowledge, Msona, hint? Uh, no, at everybody, you know, uh, who already who's, uh, who's there. Like I brought Kama back, I brought uh, Washington back. And it's clear when you bring someone back, it's not for one game. It's a part of a strategic plan. Yeah? And it's crystal clear that the plan was we want to qualify for the African Cup of Nations. We didn't qualify it. We, uh, don't let forget that. And uh, that these players will play a role until there. Yes, I, I will not uh, call someone in for one game. I will not do that. And uh, it's a strategic decision. And um, so we must also bring, of course, step by step young players in and make a gradual transition because there comes a time in one or two years a new generation of players will have to, to, to lead the team. Yeah? But is the right time now to put them in, to throw them in the fire? Yeah, this is all the questions, you know, what we have to ask. And, uh, and we must also respect of the good results now the, the, the players achieved in the last games. The last two matches were even more difficult than the, than the, the first uh, two because uh, our game was suddenly then on a Thursday, not on a Friday. Again, I lacked one day training. Some players only arrived Tuesday evening. Imagine, so you have one hour training session before an international game. The rest is uh, meetings, analysis, talking. And um, this was very, very difficult. And the, the Na Namibia team, they, they, they progressed in the last 10 years a lot. And they played in the AFCON just nine months back and went to the second round. And the coach worked with them, so we played more or less like an international club team, which was because the league was there in South Africa also uh, uh, finished in the last international campaign one week earlier. So there were one and a half weeks together. We played against a well-trained coach, club, international club team. And we with one training session with the full squad. So I was very happy when we came out of the first game. Um, with a uh, with a win, and then the say it was clear for me the second game will be more easy, not easy, but a little bit more easy for us because we were already together, and so things gets a little bit more smooth. Let's talk about that first game leading <coughs> up to that first game against Namibia. 
you've left with locally based players, you're preparing. At what moment in that preparation did you hear about the noise that were hap- was happening back home about God knows Murida? Um, I don't know exactly when. Let me be honest, the, 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 the local group is around one third, maximum 50 percent. Yeah? And for the local group, I must also say the players who are coming out, uh, we, we have to do something here in the long run. It's difficult because the conditions are difficult. So that they can, because the young players in Europe, they're now very well trained. So in future, we'll get for the local base players even more and more difficult. They must really work hard here uh, to, to, to not fall too much behind. No? Uh, and uh, with God knows, look, uh, God knows Moriva, uh, that's a position we didn't have so many players. I approached an older player, he was not interested anymore in the national team. Okay, then we said, okay, who can play on that position? And we said, okay, that could be God knows, or uh, Manuel Chalai, and um, uh, Andrew Mbeba, yeah? from uh, the local games. And of course I had to make a decision, and I opted for God knows, for various reasons. The others are also very good players, and God knows played in the first games, he started a bit shaky, but he to game, and always when the game longer improved. And uh, so I was really satisfied, and then uh, against uh, 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 Namibia, the two games, he even improved more. And uh, there was, yes, this, this, this story, but uh, uh, how can I say? I was then asked in the press conference, I think, afterwards, football coaches are under pressure. And, uh, and then they make sometimes under pressure. I also made in my past not just always wise comments. Yeah? Some unwise comments. For me, not a big problem. I gave my answer in the press conference, but I can tell you, like in a, uh, I had, I was fortunate enough to work in different countries, but I can tell you, in most countries I worked, if a local coach would talk like that about a national coach in public, his career would be over. No comment, just the doors closed, one day to the next. People must a little bit be more. Yeah, more, 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 uh, not, not let them driven by anger and emotions. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I never ordered someone. Yeah. It was clear we are traveling on Sunday. We are playing on Thursday. I need every player in training as early as possible. And uh, then it was clear if a player plays on Sunday, local player, I will not be able to use him in training until Wednesday. I said, look, then it will be difficult for me. So I would have opted for another uh, player. And then actually it was fair because both players, uh, both teams in that match had, uh, I think, their captain not in the team in the same position. <laughs> so I think more fair I couldn't be uh, uh, in that point. But for me, that is... So were, you, so were you surprised that he lost his captaincy over that issue? <laughs> That has nothing to do with me. I, I think that's his decision. He must have his reasons. Uh, what can I say? I don't think it's the end of the world for God knows. Um, he is now, I think, captaining the local Chan team. I know uh, we know his, uh, his skills. We know his strong points. We also know his areas for improvement. What the club is doing in that regard, that his decision doesn't concern me at all or, or, or the Chan team or whatever. And moving on to the games that are coming. Like you said, we sometimes look at, you know, we don't look at the smaller, the, the smaller picture. From the victories against Namibia, the expectation has gone up the roof. It's almost like we're already at AFCON. As a coach, how are you facing the upcoming games, the Kenya game, the Cameroon game? Yeah, look, uh, we take first, there are two games. Basically, we have two shots. But we take it one by one. And uh, we said, okay, already in terms of organization, 
what can we do do better to be able to perform against these teams and uh, um, the last game you saw we played in in Johannesburg against Namibia and we said look training quite difficult the hotel which was very good but it was fully booked Johannesburg is a hub you cannot come in the last minute so hotels booked training pitches booked the quality of the, of the training pitch overused because now the teams are training sometimes where we st uh, trained in a historic park there was uh, i think three teams on one day used the same pitch and the, 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 there was uh, there's i think five games from Orlando Pirates in the Orlando stadium and we said hey pff, the pitch is not going to get better and if a bad a pitch is not good luck or accident can play a big role and we said look let's look where can we how can we improve in that area for us and uh, uh, to make the conditions even better which they were good but in Johannesburg when you play on a Friday evening you need for every training you need a police escort if there's one accident you 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 spend a lot of time in the bus mm. and we said how can we improve that and then we looked around and then we found a plan A or B and we said look let's look how it is in Polokwane the stadium and uh, we inquired we also looked and uh, it looks like this is maybe the best pitch in South Africa currently or one of the best pitches then we say hey look is there an opportunity if we can play there and maybe train? Because, uh, yes, then we looked around, we found uh, three hotels, which are decent, but one which would have been perfect. And then we were a bit disappointed because that hotel, until yesterday, around noontime, it was full. And uh, then we got a call yesterday afternoon, yeah, uh, while I was watching the... the, the, the the Chan team in a training game. And then we got a call. Hey, it looks like we can get a hotel. And uh, it's uh, a hotel which is uh, 20 kilometers outside of uh, Pologuane with two training fields. Because before, when we were training in Joburg, it was good, everything. But we, suddenly the next team was waiting. You could never train 10 minutes longer just yeah. to, 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 to train set pieces or so. It was the next team was waiting. And it was really a bit difficult. So we said, hey, if we get this hotel, we anyway have to go. And then we get yesterday the confirmation of the hotel with two training pitches, a high performance center there. And we say, hey, we need to grab this opportunity. And the way it looks, the game is going to be uh, in uh, against Kenya in Polokwane. I have such fond memories of Polokwane. The last time Zimbabwe was there um, was the... Uh, uh, the uh, Kosafa Cup and we won that Kosafa Cup. Okay. So I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very ideal location in terms of vicinity to Zimbabwe as well as Zimbabweans that are in Polokwane that come to support. How important is support? Like yes. you we played that against Namibia in an empty stadium. Yes, uh, I mean the first game was the home game of Namibia and they didn't want spectators. Part of the uh, I don't know if it was really nece necessary or not, but uh, um, you see, Kenya did the same against Cameroon. Uh, uh, they would have had 20,000 spectators against Cameroon uh, and they, they opted to play in an empty yeah, stadium. Yeah. So they tried all their luck with all these things. It didn't work out. No? And, uh, and uh, for us, uh, it was also, we said, hey, we had good support in Johannesburg, but how is it in Pologuane? But we put all the facts together. Look, if you play on a Friday afternoon in, uh, in Johannesburg, Soweto, you come from the Gauteng area, you sit one and a half to two hours in the car. No doubt. There is no doubt. I lived five years in Joburg. Believe me, I know it. <laughs> and if you have bad luck, maybe the road is completely closed. It happened. So we said, hey, look, if the people who are coming there will sit one and a half hours in the car, how far is it in Polokwane? When you come from Joburg, it's a three hours drive in a different direction without so much traffic. So if someone can drive one and a half hours, he can also drive three hours. 
it's not so much a difference yeah in a, in a, and uh, so we said okay that shouldn't be a problem then there's a community then for Logwani in in um, with also many Zimbabweans then it's closer to the border maybe some people were there so then we said okay what can we estimate maybe 75 percent of the attendance from uh, Joburg maybe also 100 percent the same attendance but it's not that we expect uh, an empty stadium Yes. So um, and the stadium is perfect. The pitch is brilliant. The, 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 there's not much so traffic. It's more calm. And the hotel when we we have the pitch at the hotel, the training pitch. We, I have first time maybe I have time to meet players to talk to them because we are not sitting one or two hours in a bus for going to a training. <laughs> so it helps us a lot. And and then we think that is a perfect choice for this game. And. Uh, um, and uh, so, so I think with the Kosafa background you mentioned, I think we can be very happy. So the, I can just say to the to the fans, look that you plan your work schedule and your uh, uh, things that you can drive to Polokwane. Right. It's worth it. It's wor- definitely worth it. And you're not stopping there because we've got a game against Cameroon. Yes. What are the plans in terms of travel, oh, look, especially for us fans? I give you now. Uh, we we even talked um, you must see we're a small federation we don't have yet the department of national team coordination or national team administration so people like um, uh, in the office they're doing other jobs but they're also doing this and uh, with the hotel i must also praise our federation uh, how they were working for that especially uh, my colleague kutsai uh, who was a lot behind that uh, they do a very good work and 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 uh, it's you need to to uh, to be persistent you need to be nagging you cannot just give up if things don't go straight away so with the, the second match we said look it's our second shot you never know in life sometimes things can go well but sometimes uh, uh, also bad for reasons sometimes beyond your control and we said okay we must take the second match as serious as the first match very simple. So then we had two ideas. We we said, okay, let's approach the, the, the Cameroonian team if they do not want to play their home game in South Africa. Because you must think, all four teams are in South Africa. And it's a little bit of nonsense. Then all four teams are traveling away to play against each other again. I mean, from a climate point of view, from a cost point of view, when you put everything, and Cameroon is already qualified, you know, and, and, and even Kenya, they, 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 they are also in South Africa and Namibia playing against each other. And we said, hey, let's them approach. Maybe it's just they want to, to, to play on a good pitch in South Africa. But it seems, appears to, it's a bit complicated. You don't know who to talk to at the moment, Cameroon. And what There's we got. There's a lot happening there. <coughs> yes. And the, the response we got, no, I think we play in Yaounde. And. So we said, okay, if they do not want to buy into that idea, what are we doing? We already had that thought that in, in uh, three weeks ago. And uh, the one idea is, uh, we said, okay, if we have to go to, to Yaounde and traveling, we are this and that, we are from door to door, 25 hours, maybe 30. Suddenly, the last minute, they changed the venue, which they did before, maybe 30 hours on the road. That's hap- that happened to Namibia. When they played against Kenya, they had three days only between the matches. They traveled 30 hours, very difficult. And then they played in a fatigue state against Kenya and they lost 2-1. And if they would have beaten Kenya, maybe they, we would have met a completely different uh, Namibian team. And uh, But these things play a huge role in in, in also for a football team, the, the traveling. So... We only opportunity we de- we do. What about charter flight? So the idea came out a charter flight, and we inquired. A charter flight costs you around two hundred thousand bucks, which is a lot of money. If it's a bigger plane, even more. If it's a smaller, maybe you have you get a cheaper rate, but just roughly, and say, oh, that's not good. At the moment, there's no income. Yeah, two hundred thousand. How we can do that? So okay. And then we got an idea, which uh, was in countries before I worked with, when we had a charter flight, that we sell tickets. 
So the idea is currently there that we might get a charter flight and uh, depending on the demand, maybe selling 50 or 100 tickets to interested people who want to travel with the national team to, to, to Cameroon to watch the game. To basically partly finance that cost that we uh, that the burden is not higher than when we would fly uh, in a normal uh, with the with the whole delegation with the normal uh, flights so that would be then from Joburg or even Pologuane because there's an international airport which facilitates many things to go to Yaounde or wherever the game is and then from there straight to 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 Harare you also uh, save a night because you can depart after the game you don't need to stay one more night, maybe until the next day the departure is. So, um, so the current uh, uh, idea is to get a charter, to see the game as important, like a decisive match, to get a charter and, uh, and maybe selling 50, 60, I don't know how many tickets to, to people who are interested to tr travel with the national team. Of course, the national team cannot make the visa for them, but uh, uh, I think that shouldn't be a big, big, big problem. But so uh, support so, us if you are interested to, to in that idea get in touch with the federation as quick as possible. Maybe the tickets, sir. maybe the tickets are quickly <laughs> gone. So the coach is saying you have two opportunity. We have two opportunities in which two shots to qualify. We can either do it in the Kenya game or we can do it in the Cameroon game. If the Kenya game, you can travel if you're coming from Zimbabwe to Polokwane. If you're in South Africa, wherever you are, to Polokwane. And if we qualify, oh, good, nice. If we don't, we still have the Cameroon game. And in that Cameroon game, you can go and support the Warriors by being on the charter flight. Seems like a good plan. Because yeah, it's, sometimes... Uh, it's still, look, it's still an idea. If... Uh, there are nobody interested in Zimbabwe, <laughs> then uh, uh, then it, you, you then it will be the, difficult the to refinance hours, to re yeah. re refinance. But if there's maybe two hundred people coming or three hundred, then we might even have to to charter a seven four seven. I don't know if it can start and land. But there. I, li I like the idea that the ideas because the honest truth is the perception out there. Sometimes we think are people working at Zifa because. Obviously, people get frustrated with certain issues. So it's nice to know that with the time frame, there's already a plan A, a plan B, and probably a plan C and D, whatever, how many plans that are there. For you as the coach, there's a question that I know if you go without me asking, people will feel shortchanged. Are the conversations with Knowledge Musona happening? Okay, let me first answer what you just said, something else. You said if uh, people are working at CIFA, they're working very hard, very hard. I would. It was two weeks ago, uh, the general secretary, the TD, and me, we left office Friday evening at 8 o'clock. So a week later, there was from FIFA, the guys accounting and, uh, you know, looking if everything is done properly. I think they were working until 10 o'clock and some until 12 o'clock in the night. I can tell you, I worked in countries with good work ethics. Go to Japan, believe me, it's difficult to beat them in work ethic. And uh, But uh, what I've seen here so far is excellent, excellent. And uh, these uh, this, uh, this, uh, this people are working there. It's a small federation. People have two, three jobs because you must also see there's no source of income except the, 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 the FIFA. So uh, people are sometimes overloaded. And uh, therefore, they make mistakes. And uh, it's similar like at the beginning in, in Kosovo. It was the same situation. Just the, the federation had seven or eight employees. And when I left, I think it was 60. And uh, it w was very similar. So, But what I can tell you, uh, uh, they're working very hard. And, uh, and, uh, and the general secretary, I have not seen before a general secretary until 10 or 12 o'clock in the office. You, you show me, I worked with a couple of federations and uh, with many general secretaries. And, uh, uh, and uh, I'm, uh, it's time for me also to say that things and to stop that, uh, that conversation of are they working, are they doing this or that. Yes, they make mistake, I make mistake. 
But I tell you, people have two or three jobs. Uh, and uh, I want to clarify that straight away. There's not a lack of, of, of uh, work ethic or of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, lack of skills. When things happening, it's sometimes also lack of, 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 uh, of staff. And that lack of staff is a lack of resources. So very simple. Um, and, uh, and we are trying creatively to solve situations, like, for example, the traveling to, 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 to Cameroon. That's a creative idea. And we must see how the public are buying. If we get a hundred calls over the weekend that uh, we want to be on that flight, we want to, how much is the ticket? And we know, oh, there's a big demand. And we can straight away next week either have a small plane or a, or a Jumbo 747. Yeah. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, so that is one issue which I want to really stress at this moment. And uh, I also, I said it before, how the interview process was done. Not because I was selected. I can easily say that because I was selected now. But let me be honest, I told it to my friend. I said, hey, I don't know. I think they studied all 200 CVs they got. <laughs> you know, in some countries, they just throw them in the, in the bin. They're in the bin, <laughs> and they actually, which is very depressing or uh, for people who apply, but also young people when they... Uh, want to work or so, you know, I have also uh, Tell you children. put in this file, then you know, ah. Uh, you I know, and, uh, and uh, that was for me also one major reason because I could still have said no or, you know, or doing something else. And, and uh, so that I think I want to clarify and end that discussion straight away. And then and we uh, move to the elephant in the room. Are there conversations happening between you and Knowledge Muswana? There were conversations and they are ongoing. Uh, he, I think he has tomorrow a game, if I'm not mistaken. So you must always see, and I will get in touch with him again. Um, there is no pressure from my side. Yeah. Any, yeah. Any and also uh, on other players, there is never pressure. If, if a player, the players have valid arguments, valid. Yeah, they must have things, not nice things going on in the past. Let me be straight honest. No? And the players got very frustrated. And if a player decides to play for the national team, uh, um, he must be sure his body is capable of doing that with all the travel stress, the times, the, 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 all these things, uh, and to be able to perform. It's not just about coming back. And, I- and uh, the, the, the talks are ongoing. And let's see what is the outcome. And whatever the outcome is, we have to respect and not then judge it on this and that. I can say I will try my best to get the best possible team and the best possible players at this moment to the national team. But if I would ask a player like no Knowledge Musona, it's not for one game. Then it's for a strategic decision for a year, one and a half year. But it will be clear, then uh, I have to respect that. On the other side, uh, um, I need to hear to the players' arguments. And, and I think I think having traveled extensively in the past with the national team, sometimes you, you do have an insight into maybe frustrations that leave people to such decisions, but fans just want the players look, back. Look, I also slept at airports with national teams. What just happened to to uh, Nigeria. to Nigeria? I was stranded with the team middle in the night in 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 Equatorial Guinea in 2006. No hotel, nothing. We had to split the group in, and we slept at strangers' houses. I went through all this, and it was very hard. Traveling in Africa is alone, very hard. The distances are big, and the the the, the uh, and the travel the airports and uh, sometimes the connections are not good so it's very stressful and, uh, and i can tell you it was one of the reasons why i was happy that i could start in europe in working because the distances are smaller the airports are of high quality the hotels are always fine and it is much more easy and very much less Hustle. stress and uh, really, and when I applied, that was one of my worries. I said, oh, I, I, I don't want to go through that again. I, uh, no, I, I went uh, out of that stage. And that's why I'm pressing so much, because you must understand, we are, uh, how do you say, it's like you rent a car. We, we rent some Ferraris, Porsches, Mercedes, uh, and uh, we use them. 
A player is an employee of a club. They earn their salary there. They get here maybe allowance or fee or what, but it's nothing comparable to their salary in their club if they play in decent clubs. For a local player, yes, it's something different. Or maybe from a smaller club. But for the top players, it's nothing to compare what they earn. So we are renting highly skilled employee employees from clubs. And what we have to do is to treat them in the certain respect. If you have a Porsche, you give me a Porsche to, to rent for the weekend and I bring it to you back with, with scratches and this, that, you will be upset. So we have to be very mindful and careful of the clubs who are the, the, the employers of the players. So if we get them and they play sometimes on Sunday and we play on Friday, four or five days later they have to perform and four or five days later again they have to, 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 to perform on a match. So when they come and uh, they cannot say I have back pain because I was sitting 20 hours on a flight like this, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's why these, these top guys, you know, these countries like Cameroon, why you think they have success? Of course they have success because they're very good players. But they're traveling since 25 years in uh, charter flights with charter the national flights, teams. Yeah. The top players come with a private flight to, mm -hmm. from Europe with a Learjet or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And and when they play away, they, they stay in five-star hotels and, 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 uh, and uh, with a charter flight. Uh, it's very simple. They, they understood in time, the government or whatever, or the sponsors, in time that a team can only perform if these conditions are properly done. On the World Cup level, they didn't understand it yet because that's why always you have trouble with national teams when they take part in the World Cup. If Africa can get that sorted out, I'm pretty sure we'll see soon a team maybe winning the World Cup. So are there any other players besides knowledge? Because in previously you said in this conversation, you hinted at the fact that Obviously, there's a transition plan for the younger players, but ideally there's some older players maybe that would be helpful in the fold. Are there any other players you're, you're in conversation with? Look, uh, I cannot talk with every player every day. I have a big list of players. Sometimes people wake me up five o'clock in the morning and say, recommend me a player. Then I look at it as fifth division, sixth division in England. I'm sorry. If I start that, I have 200 national team players. Not to discredit a player, but if you want to be in a national team player, I also have to trust the natural selection of football competition. So if a player is good enough for national team, he needs to play in a certain level. Very simple. So um, uh, otherwise I, I will not be able to, to select a team. And um, I have a big list. And... Uh, I'm not talking yet to all players. I've talked at the beginning to, I think, 25 players from outside. No? It's a, how can I say? At the right time, do we think we have to make this step or not? There's with one other player discussions going on, but... Um, it's, it's not going to be everybody on a fan's wish look, list. I cannot have the oldest yes. attacking line in the world. If I have an average age of 35 years of the attacking line, I think we will not succeed. Very simple. Very simple. Very deep? No, yes, no. Uh, it's, uh, it's the nature of the thing. So, so I must be very mindful. If I bring a player in, he blocks a position for a young player for a certain period of time. So don't then come to me, why is not this young player in the squad and this and that? It is very simple. The position will be blocked for one year. If the player is fit, or at least the, the, the priority spot will be blocked. So we must be very mindful how we do that, because uh, I think uh, you have enough talent if we make it in a, in a sophisticated way, in a proper strategic way, and not in a strategic in a way, you will have, uh, we can develop something the next one to two years that you can, uh, what you can, uh, where you can bank on the next five to 10 years. Coach, having had this conversation with you one-on-one, -on -one, um, 
I sort of feel like I would want to see what the next year or two years brings because you seem to really have a strategy on how you want to use these players. Because for people like me, who, when it comes to the national team, you're obviously a fan first before you're a journalist. Uh, you have your wish list. You you want your now. You want your results now. You want this player who is Zimbabwean born and played there. And I understand your strategy. And thank you very much for explaining to us and making very clear that there is a process. There is a way. And also, it does not mean every person out there in the world, whatever league you're in, you can come into the national team. There is a way. There is a standard. Yes, of course. But uh, also, you must see... Don't write anybody off. Yeah, uh, Football is a bit strange. <laughs> Why players play, don't play, sometimes has funny reasons. And uh, and uh, in a club, sometimes they want to sell a player. So they promote one and the other sits on the bench. Yeah. And then uh, uh, then the, suddenly the other one is in the, in the, in the, in the regular playing. The, it has uh, many reasons. Um, and... Yes, uh, but if I see a hidden potential in someone where I say, hey, should, why did nobody see it? Then, of course, look, I'm giving you an example. I'm pretty sure if I would have had a, a young Kamabilia at the age of 20, 21 in my squad, he would be a household star in, uh, in Europe. Why the, the scouts from Europe didn't see it? I have no idea. I have really no idea. But the skills would have been there to be a household name in, in Europe. He, he was a, he's a household name in Africa. But he could have one step uh, from a skill and from a talent point of view. Why the scouts didn't see it? I really have no idea. He, I cannot understand it. Yeah? And uh, uh, we take the situation as it is. Yeah? He, we are happy he's here. He's now 34 years old, but he's still in a very good shape. And we are very happy about that. But uh, not always the coaches and the scouts get it right. So uh, I don't. I want to encourage each player, hey, if not selected or if in the team it does not work, don't give up. Um, uh, there are many mistakes made in, in football. Big clubs, they rebuy players. They didn't see the potential. Then they spent millions to buy the player back they formed. <laughs> Uh, there are plenty of examples like that, which they thought had ah, the players not good enough or physically not strong enough. And then suddenly, five years later, they see, oh man, what did we make a mistake? They buy him of 20, 30 million back. I think Jordi Alba or so was a case, Marco Royce was a case. Uh, uh, and these are very often top players. You know? And uh, so, the, the, the very important is resilience for young players. When things don't go the way, you cannot give up. It must push you to more motivation. This resilience is very, very, very important in sports. If you if you don't have this tolerance to 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 in situations, you will not come far. You're not come far. And coach, um, obviously, time is always a factor. Yes. Is there anything that I haven't asked about? Anything that you felt like I just wanna. I just want to let Zimbabwe know, oh, this is an area that I think I need to speak on. Well, yeah, you ask me now. Look, I can only repeat, I want to repeat that again. I have my colleague Jasper here. At the Federation, they're doing a really good job. They're working hard. in that Under difficult situation, after the ban, after uh, 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 with limited resources, and I think they're giving their best. And I think we must always appreciate that. Eh? All of them are working very hard. If there's mistakes, it comes sometimes out of overload and uh, uh, triple functions. That is, I want to repeat that. And the second thing I want to repeat that, guys, if you are want to be on that possible charter, you get to knock on the doors <laughs> at CIFA because the, if the tickets might be gone, you're on... Uh, you might be late. Maybe it's first. Uh, how do you say first? Uh, first, first, come, uh, first comes first. First serve. Serve basis. I do not know. It's still an idea. But if we have a, if we have but here, already show your interest through. The if idea. Uh, if we, we we need to plan and we need to plan very quick and we need to know how many would be interested in something like that. So 
Don't hesitate, phone CIFA office straight away. Hey, I want to be, give your name that they can start making a list. <laughs> November is around the corner. It happens to be my birthday month and hoping that it, it brings uh, Africa of Nations a qualification. A coach, all the best in the coming games against Kenya, against Cameroon. I know you're going to work hard. I hope and pray. And I know that you will assemble the best available squad. And whoever you're talking to in the backgrounds will come back and will have the strongest possible squad that we can have. Yeah, thanks a lot. Look, we are going to work hard, but also smart. Work hard, sure. <laughs> but also work smart. <laughs> I hope you got an insight into our current Warriors coach, Michael Nees, just getting to pick his brain a bit about his plans for the Warriors, as well as get an idea on where he's coming from. Like we said earlier on, there's a tendency sometimes when a new coach comes and he's foreign to immediately say, is that a plumber? What's happening? But like the coach said, Sometimes don't look at the names of the countries and think, ah, oh, they're coming from this country. So we're hoping, I'm hoping this interview, I will play it again. <laughs> After we qualify and say, look, this man had a plan and that plan worked. Until next week when we bring you another bigger sporting personality here on the Spotlight with Yvonne Mangunda on the Ola 7 podcast. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your family. And also, like he said, if you're interested in going to Cameroon, make sure. And for those in Polokwane, you never know. The Warriors could be in your area, will be in your area in November. Goodbye. the little things that make us giants in our industry. We put in that extra mile of service so your car can go that extra mile of performance. Our aim is to make our stopovers feel like home. Giant Petroleum. Limitless Energy.